The information provided on this podcast is for general informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Reliance on any information provided here is solely at your own risk. Welcome. This is Birth Baby. Your hosts are Sierra Morgan and Samantha Kelly. Sierra is a birth doula, hypnobirthing educator, and pediatric sleep consultant. Samantha is a birth doula, childbirth educator, and lactation counselor. Join us as we guide you through your options for your pregnancy, birth, and postpartum journey. Thank you to our listeners for your continued support. If you enjoy our content, please be sure to like, follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps us gain visibility to other people that could benefit from listening in. Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about what C-section recovery looks like because we have families who either plan a C-section or maybe they don't and they haven't even thought about this before. So maybe that's you. You don't think you're going to get a C-section, but it's really good ahead of time to think about what recovery might look like. So Sam, do you want to start us off with kind of what type of cesareans even are possible? Yes, absolutely. If you're watching the YouTube video today, you're going to notice that I look a little bit like um, what we lovingly refer to as a dungeon troll. And that's because I had the pleasure of attending a cesarean this morning and I'm tired. So um if you get to see me online, that's that, that. This is what happens when your doula comes to your cesarean early in the morning. <laughs> also, I really love that we just are who we are and we show up how we show up. And you know what? This is what we look like when we come to you. Well, maybe not me right now. I'm freshly showered. But this is what we look like when we come to you at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or whatever. And uh, it's fine. Absolutely. I was just happy I remembered to brush my teeth before running out the door half asleep. So... <laughs> At least they make you wear a mask in the OR. Exactly. (laughs) Um, So there are different types of cesareans. And I think we could get into a whole episode of like what cesareans could look like and like what, like all the different types of like scars and incisions and everything like that. But we're going to focus on how like recovery uh, looks with what kind of cesarean you had. So we're going to be focusing on Um, two different kinds. So one is a planned C-section. So this might be for someone who has a breech baby and they are choosing to have a um, cesarean delivery instead of a vaginal delivery of a breech baby. Um, It could be if you have a like placenta previa or like anything kind of health-wise going on that is going to preclude you from having a vaginal delivery. Um, so with a planned C-section, generally you, you know, what's happening, you kind of get to pick your day, you, you know, roll in sometime, you know, generally in the morning and get to have your, have your baby that day. Um, generally with planned C-sections, you have a spinal instead of an epidural. Um, so this is like a shot that goes into your spine, um, rather than having the epidural catheter. Um, and it kind of just covers things a little bit differently than an epidural would. So with planned C-sections, obviously, you know, you, you know, what's happening. Um, their emotional work that goes into preparing yourself for a C-section can be done over, you know, the days or weeks leading up to this planned uh, surgical delivery, or as I call it sometimes, the sunroof delivery. I've heard people um, say belly birth too, and I kind of like that. Yeah, that's that's really sweet, belly birth. I like that. Um, but so that's kind of what a planned C-section might look like. And then we have uh, our unplanned C-sections. So this is typically if you've been laboring or if you have started laboring and then a cesarean becomes necessary for any variety of reasons. There's so many different reasons that we could be looking at a cesarean um, during labor. Um, And this tends to look a little bit differently. This means that you have been planning on and imagining and preparing for this vaginal delivery. You've kind of at least started that process of laboring and done a good bit of that work. 
Um, and then your plans have to change. So there tends to be, you know, you have to do all of that uh, work of preparing yourself for a surgery, a, a fairly major surgery, really quickly. And then there's a lot of feelings that may be going into it. And the recovery can look a little bit different based on that because you might have some trauma or just some feelings that you have to work with afterwards um, that are a little bit different than if you were having a planned cesarean delivery. And then there's also the piece of your body is probably more tired than it would be Mm -hmm. with a planned cesarean. So not just emotionally, but physically you're more exhausted. Um, Maybe you got to five centimeters and you're getting a cesarean for some reason, or maybe you've been pushing for five hours and you are having a cesarean. So though, even those two, um, even though they're both unplanned can have a different level of recovery and one may have more pelvic floor issues, you know, like, so there are definitely mm-hmm. other physical aspects that go into it. And I, I want to go back real quick to the planned cesarean. It also could be somebody who's had, is having a repeat cesarean and maybe mm-hmm. your first one was unplanned. And then now you're planning this one because that feels safer to you than having a V back and all of those things are valid. So, um, Anything else about that piece, Sam, that I'm missing? I don't think so. I think we'll cover a little bit more, like just kind of compare and contrast as we go through the rest of them. I've got to pause. I told him I would check on him in two minutes. Hold on. I'm recording, right? Okay, wait, hold on. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the actual recovery might look like in a C-section. Can you kind of give us a little brief outline of what that might look like? Yeah. So when we talk about recovery, we're talking about that kind of sounds like a long-term word, but we use that as the word for what we do right after a cesarean. So just a little reminder that if you have a doula that you have in your planned or unplanned cesarean, uh, or you're going into one, you can advocate for them to be in the room with you as well. So there are different rules at different places. And if you want to go more into that and what that all can look like, um, we have an episode, I think it's called What Happens When Things Don't Go As Planned. So go back and listen to that episode for sure. Um, But that first little recovery portion is usually about the first two hours post-surgery. So you go into something called the PACU, and I never remember what this stands for. So do you know, Sam, or am I putting you on the spot too? Oh gosh. (laughs) One of the feedback items that we got from people um, when we asked for feedback one time was that sometimes we say things and then we don't say what that means. And so this is one of them. So Sam might Google while I finish talking about this. But you go into the PACU and that's the little recovery area. And again, this looks different at different hospitals. Sometimes this is that you're going into um, almost like a triage space where there's a bunch of different beds and they're all just separated by a little piece of cloth. Or sometimes it's a full-on separate room that you get to go into. I'm thinking here in Austin, we have both of those options um, at local hospitals. Did you find it? Post-anesthesia care unit. Amazing. I would not have guessed that. And that's great. Okay. Um, and then also you will have a Foley catheter in during this time. So again, like she said, the spinal and the epidural are covered differently. So if you're going from an unplanned cesarean or, and you have been laboring and you had an epidural already, they will try to bolus that epidural, which means give you more of that medication so that they're able to just keep you epiduralized and you don't have to change the type of pain management that you have. But either if it's not strong enough or if you, and, and they bolus it and it's not working, or if they are giving it um, as a first, this is the first time you're getting any pain medication. They'll just give you a spinal. And then unfortunately, if neither of those things work, you may have to go under general anesthesia. That's pretty rare. Mm-hmm. Um, I've only had, I think I've only had one person that an epidural and a spinal both did not work for them at all. And they had to be put under general and it wasn't an emergency cesarean. It was just a failure to progress. Mom's like, yeah, that's it. I'm done. And we go to a cesarean. Um, we have had people, we had a mom with twins that had her first baby 
she was epiduralized. First baby comes out, baby A, just fine. Baby B then has to be taken by general anesthesia cesarean because mom was bleeding too much and they weren't able to bolus that epidural enough to get it going. So just kind of some examples of how that might be different or why. But with all of these options, you get what's called a Foley catheter and that's them basically peeing for you. I always joke that that's kind of nice because it's like the longest you've had to go throughout your pregnancy without having to go to the bathroom. Um, so that, yeah. So they'll have that in with you. I always joke that maybe I should get one too in birth. So I'm like, man, that'd be really nice as the doula to not have to go to the bathroom all the time. Um, so you will have that in until all of that numbness wears off. And a spinal does wear off more quickly than an epidural does. Mm -hmm. So they'll work with you for that. They usually get you up about six to 12 hours post-birth. That's quite a range, six to 12 hours. Um, part of it is dealing with the type of medication that was used. So some of these medications make it so it's harder to void and use the restroom afterward. Some of them make it so that it uh, numbs you for a lot longer or you feel a little bit out of sorts and you're not able to stand on your own anytime sooner. So it's really going to depend on the unit that you're getting the cesarean in and what medications were used on you and how your recovery is going. But they do yeah. want to get you up and moving around. We just definitely don't you just laying around for days. Um, it causes mm -hmm. other problems. And then you usually are discharged within 48 to 72 hours, as long as you and baby are doing well. Yeah. Did I miss anything there? No, I think that, I think that covers it. And a lot of these things are going to be really dependent on like hospital policies and even like your doctor's policies, your nurse's policies. I've seen like it, when we're talking about like eating and drinking, I don't know if we mentioned that eating oh, and drinking didn't. after a C-section. Um, I've seen wildly different policies. Sometimes they're totally happy to let you have a couple of sips of water, you know, as soon as you feel okay with it. And they're more worried about you throwing up. Or I've heard like, we want to make sure that the, like your bowels are awake because the anesthesia kind of puts your, your bowels and your whole, like your intestines and everything to sleep. And so they want to make sure that those are working well before they start giving you food and drink. Um, and so I hear like really varying things on, on that, like, you know, maybe two hours and you can start nibbling on some food. And then other times it's like, no, at two hours, maybe I'll let you have some juice. Yeah, um, so the places, it, because yeah. it's so wildly different as a doula, we get to see all different scenarios, right? Like your situation is your one situation or two or however many C-sections you've had. We've been to a lot more than that. And it's kind of weird because we may have had quite a few cesareans with a doctor who's like, or, you know, it's usually the aftercare nurses, but who are saying, oh, sure, like we can start right away with ice. And yeah, you can have a few sips of water. And like after an hour, we maybe are allowed to eat a little bit of something. Whereas then we others, you know, we're usually there one to two hours postpartum. And sometimes they're not even allowed to eat until after we already are leaving. Oh, so yeah. by the way, in that first two hours, usually that you're in that recovery area, that is the time length as long as there are no other complications. So if you had something like preeclampsia or um, any other sort of situation or interventions mm -hmm. are needed for those things, you may be in that area longer uh, before you go to a regular postpartum unit. And it's not because they're just wanting to be annoying. It's because the postpartum unit doesn't have the ability to stabilize you with the medications that you may need during that time. Yeah. So, um, all right. So then we have long-term recovery. So that was the immediate postpartum, that first couple of hours. And then we have long-term long -term recovery. So things that we need to look out for there are limited movement, not, and also the way that we're moving when we, yeah. when we do this, go back and listen to the episodes of Dr. Milo about diastasis and the things that you can do to help maintain, um, your muscles and pelvic floor and all of those things. It's crazy because just the way that you get up out of bed can make a difference. So look into mm -hmm. those things. They call it, I think she called it the mermaid that she mm -hmm. suggests doing when we get up and out of bed, which I'm a bad girl was totally not doing. Even everyone should do it really. Um, yeah. So limited movement, extra help might be needed, especially at night when you're getting up to use the restroom. It's a little bit darker. We want to make sure you're not falling or stumbling when you're getting out of bed, tripping. Uh, yeah. Pain medication is could be something that's on board. A lot of places just use Tylenol and Motrin and they al alternate those. But some people do need more extensive medications. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing with pain medication that I always tell my, my C-section clients is that 
you, when, when we're talking about long-term recovery, like when you're in the hospital, you, you know, you have a nurse who's coming and kind of following up with you and seeing how your pain and everything is. And then a lot of times, especially for anyone who has other children at home, they go home and they want to tough it out because they feel like, you know, oh, I have a high pain tolerance. I know I can handle this. And sure, you you can, but you don't need to. Um, and you really you shouldn't. shouldn't. Yeah. Because there's a lot of reasons. You know, one of the things is that, you know, one, you've had a major, it, it is a major abdominal surgery. It is something, you know, much larger than a lot of the things that the majority of us are experiencing. And, you know, like people who have like knee surgeries and things like that, like they're on like heavy painkillers for kind of a long time afterwards. And PT. Exactly. And so much PT, and we're not getting that. We don't get any of that. So the Tylenol and the Motrin that they're recommending that you take every four to six hours after you have your baby is really important because your pain with that cert- with that incision can kind of get away from you. And once it's gotten away from you, it's so much harder to catch. And then you might start needing some of those heavier things like, you know, the what is it? The codeine, Tylenol. Hydrocodone. Thing. Yeah, that yeah. you know that one. Some and some people need that anyways, depending on how your body metabolizes those pain medications. But it's so important to not let that pain medication or let, not let that pain get away from you, and to stay on top of that. I think that's like one of the things I just really feel like is important to hammer home because so many people feel like, oh, I can do it, I can do it. You know, I went through 24 hours of unmedicated labor and then I had a, you know, cesarean. I could, I could do this without it. And you can, but it's not beneficial to you. You're going to be in more pain and discomfort. You're going to have more swelling and more, you know, other things that's going on. And it can start affecting other things like your mood and your ability to sleep and even your milk supply. So yeah, breastfeeding, just mm-hmm. positions that you are in afterward are harder when you're breastfeeding after a cesarean. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I think it's really again, guys. I'm sorry. I have to pause again. I'm glad you mentioned the thing about not like foregoing the Tylenol and Motrin and being a hero because you just think, oh, maybe I don't need it. Because I think people don't realize that, that the pain can get out of hand. Um, So at least for the first couple of days, just following those guidelines is usually super smart. And then also looking for and watching for infection. So if you just start to feel Mm -hmm. fluey or um, you are not, you know, maybe there's like pain on the incision or like it's really, really sore there and more, you're like, I'm taking the medicine, but something just doesn't feel right. Or it's hot to the touch, things like that. You know, always, it's always okay to call in and ask, Hey, is what I'm dealing with normal or, and ask to go get checked out, go back and listen to, um, the birth story with Andrea Sanchez. I mean, she had her VBAC story, um, for her first birth, her cesarean, she ended up with wound care, right? And no one was Mm -hmm. listening to her. So if you feel like that's happening, insist on being seen and talking to someone about it. Um, You may end up seeing the doctor extra times. And that's a good thing. It's good to go back and get checked out and make sure that things are going well. And recovery is typically six to eight weeks. So, um, Mm -hmm. but that looks a little bit different than it would with a vaginal birth because again, major abdominal surgery, right? You're going to be using different breastfeeding positions and all of these different things are different. If you have other kids, you're not picking them up in that amount of time. Whereas if it was a vaginal birth, you may be able to pick up your kids before that amount of time. So, really yeah. following those rules closely. Yeah, I think like, you know, we hear like a six-week recovery for vaginal delivery and, you know, talking about like six to eight weeks for a cesarean, you know, it sounds pretty close to the same. I think um, in a lot of ways it kind of can be, but I think it also, it, it's just more, maybe more of an intense six to eight weeks, not, you know, that the whole time is going to be like, really hard and you're going to be in a lot of pain or anything like that. It's just going to be like much more noticeable. I think with the vaginal delivery, you start feeling a lot better quicker and then you push yourself a little bit more and we have to like remind you to chill out with a cesarean. Uh, It's kind of the opposite. You don't really want to push yourself uh, very far and we kind of have to, you know, push you a little bit more to feel better. Or you're taking your medications as you should, or maybe taking the harder medications and you feel fine and then you're doing too much 
and then ouch, right? Uh So uh, it is really important not to do those things. And those type A personalities like me have a really hard time, even Mm -hmm. with a cesarean sitting still, they're going to push the limits. So your Mm -hmm. body's going to tell you and you're going to feel it. Um, So I think that's a really good segue talking about the differences and similarities of a vaginal birth. Can you talk to us about what those similarities are for a cesarean versus and a vaginal delivery? What's kind of the same? Yeah. So, I I mean, a lot of the things that's happening internally in your body is going to be the same, right? So you had a baby, you had a placenta, your uterus still needs to contract and shrink down. So um, you're still going to have those like afterbirth pains of of your uterus kind of shrinking. You're still going to get to have fundal rubs where, you know, in the hospital where they're coming and they're rubbing on your belly every, you know, whatever it is, 15 minutes to 30 minutes to an hour, you know, as, as things kind of space out, all of that is still going to be happening in the hospital uh, because you still had that placenta there that came away and we still need your uterus to shrink down, right? Um, which means that the lochia, which is the bleeding that happens after birth, that is still going to happen if you have a cesarean. I think a lot of people don't know that. I actually did not know that until I started training as a doula and I, I was, you know, learning about it. Um, I, you know, figured if you had a cesarean, you didn't have to do that part. Um, that's not true. You, you yeah, do. I had somebody go, well, they took out the baby. I just thought that they'd take out all of that lining and like yeah. get everything out. Um, Makes but yeah, sense. a lot of people don't realize that you still bleed after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of what that bleeding is, is not so much like, you know, things in your like placenta clearing out or things in your uterus clearing out. It's all of the extra blood that your body has created over the course of that nine months that you were carrying a baby, that has to leave. So that has to leave regardless. We can't just suction that out, though that would be a lot cleaner. Um, So lochia is still going to happen. You're still going to have the pads and all of that good stuff happening after delivery. Um, You're still going to follow kind of the same basic postpartum advice. We, We recommend, it's generally recommended, and we definitely recommend um, kind of our, our three, three, three rule, which is one week in the bed, one week on the bed and one week around the bed. Um, so, you know, with that, like that means I want you 99% of the time kind of in bed off of your perineum, laying back, um, relaxing for the first five to seven days. I'm going to say again, laying back. Laying back. Okay. Yes. Laying back. Because when people think in the bed, they're like, oh, well, I can sit in the bed. No. Yeah. We want you to recline, like she just said, in the bed. Because if you're sitting up, all of that gravity is still on your bottom. And that's mm-hmm. what we don't want. That's what we're trying to alleviate in that first week. Yeah. And your pelvic organs, everything. We want to allow everything to kind of get back to where they go. So that means you get up, go to the bathroom, get up, take a shower, get yourself a little snack, and then go back to bed. That's where you're going to be. Um, that means you're not going up and down the stairs more than once a day. For those of you that live in a one-story house, please, please, please listen to that advice. If you don't listen to anything else, listen she to that. She meant two-story house. Yeah, that. That one. <laughs> don't climb up ladders, I guess, to your one-story house either. <laughs> no getting into the attic. Generally a no-go. <laughs> um, one week in the bed, one week on the bed. So this means still spending the majority of the time off of your feet, but you are, you know, maybe now a little bit vertical. Maybe on the bed for you is on the couch sometimes. Um, So you can be a little bit more vertical, but we're still off of your feet for the majority of the time for the next five to seven days. And then one week around the bed, meaning you are probably 50-50 at this point, spending a good bit of your time off of your feet, but you're starting to get back to it. Maybe you go for a little walk, you you know, make yourself lunch one day, stuff like that. Um, But taking it really easy and listening to how your body feels. And this is doubly important with uh, cesarean recovery because we really want to make sure that um, you're not overextending yourself. Um, I really want to have an episode one day where we have a doctor come on and talk about the process of a cesarean because I think it really doesn't settle into people's minds about what that surgery has done to your abdominals and to your muscles, all of the layers that it goes through. So, hey, if you know you're going to have a cesarean or you just had a cesarean and you happened upon this episode, have your partner listen to it too. Because I think a lot of times people think, well, they just think I'm being lazy. No, you're not. And don't feel that way because we really do need, like, this is something that's required of your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
So let's see, on the bed, all that good stuff. Breastfeeding, you if you've had a cesarean, you are still able to breastfeed. That should still look pretty similar for you. Um, skin to skin after a cesarean is still super, super helpful um, whenever possible for it to happen in the OR. That is kind of the, the gold standard. That's what we would love to see if you have a doula in the OR. They can kind of help you with that. Um, sometimes it's not possible, but that doesn't mean that breastfeeding is not. So, you know, thinking about trying to get yourself um, expressing breast milk quickly after a cesarean is really helpful, whether that's your baby is nursing or if your baby is not able to nurse for some reason or another, um, hand expression and a breast pump within an hour or two of birth is super important to help kind of start establishing that milk supply so that you can have a smooth breastfeeding journey. And I think for anyone who has a cesarean, whether it was planned or unplanned, being able to do that, if that is your goal, is really helpful in your kind of mental health recovery. And so knowing those steps of, hey, I know that you know, sometimes with C-section and babies, maybe they aren't going to be able to stay with me for one reason or another. They're going to have to go to the nursery for a little bit longer and need a little bit of extra assistance. Um, I'm still going to be able to breastfeed though. And I'm just going to hand express. I'm just going to pump. I'm going to start that process as quickly as I'm able to um, after I'm, you know, in the PACU or wherever I am afterwards. Um, I would really, argue, really help. I would argue that it's even more important when Absolutely. you are having a cesarean because, if you didn't plan, sorry, if you planned a cesarean and your body never went into labor, your body didn't kick over into those hormones of labor, whereas mm -hmm. your body isn't so sure that you had a baby yet. It's like a little bit of a shock to the system. And so your body needs a chance to be able to catch up and to produce the prolactin and those things. So yeah. having that time in that first hour or two where your body is being stimulated, it's not, yes, the baby could go potentially, you know, yes. Technically, they can go more than an hour or two after birth without eating for the first time. But to establish your milk supply and to let your body know that you had a baby and that we need to start producing, getting that pump attached that at least. Yes, that oxytocin, that skin to skin. Again, even more important because your body needs to know that you have that baby. Um, and then for an unplanned cesarean where you've, you know, you're exhausted right? You've maybe mm -hmm. been going through labor for so long and you're depleted. And so e again, even more so, you need that oxytocin boost. Um, so fight for that, advocate for that with, in the hospital. You're only in the hospital having a C-section. So um, advocate yeah. for that so that you have them listening to you and helping you. Even if that means that you have a friend bringing you your breast pump from home, if they're not getting it to you fast enough in the hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of the things, a lot of these things we mention here because they are things that we of doulas have had to really advocate for over the years. And I think one of the really beautiful things that we have seen is that some of these are becoming more standardized. There are some hospitals that are just doing these things. And it's so beautiful to see the hospital that I was at with my mom today. I didn't even have to ask for skin to skin in the OR. It was, it was amazing. They just brought baby right over and tucked baby right up there. And it was amazing. Um, but then we had to advocate for other things. So it's, you know, it, just knowing all of these options are available. You can have these things. Um, you can still breastfeed. You can do all of that. Uh, and, you know, it might have to look, look a little bit different. You might have to hold baby in a little bit of a different way because maybe it's uncomfortable on your tummy or, you know, maybe you're not able to, um, you know, do like the the like sideline breastfeeding, or maybe that's the only way you can breastfeed. There's so many different different things, but there's a lot of different options that are available. And having a good team around you, I think, is is really really important here. And I think that brings us to our next thing. So, best tips for recovering from a C-section. What, what are, what is your favorite couple of ones? Yeah, honestly, the biggest one is asking for help and receiving it when it's offered. Um, it's yeah. very difficult for a lot of us in this day and age to ask for help. And it's also oddly hard for us to accept it even when we haven't asked for it. So mm -hmm. doing that so that you can do what you need to put your oxygen mask on first and then give it to your baby. Um, let other people do all of those other ancillary things that are not so important in, in your little dyad of you and baby. 
And then also just like we said before, getting plenty of rest, really following those quote unquote rules or guidelines or recommendations for um, chilling out and accept that and, and relax about it. And again, like she said, the bed doesn't have to be the bed. It can be the couch. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who really uh, gets their energy from other people and they thrive that way, if you're going to feel depressed and alone, if you're in a room by yourself, it sounds great to some people, but other people are like, that sounds really sad and lonely. And so make your bed your couch for that day. And of course, then you walk over to bed, real bed at night. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to be in the mix in the middle, then that's totally fine. Yeah. And then also, like we just said, resting, but also babying your body. When you are up, when you are doing those things throughout the day, make sure that they're gentle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to be leaning over into the washer and reaching and pulling things mm -hmm. out. You know, simple things like making your lunch, but not reaching to the highest cabinet, asking someone else to do that. So back to the first one, except asking yeah. for help. Just How about paying you? paying attention too. I think like if it hurts, maybe don't, don't do that. Don't like do soreness, absolutely. You're going to have some soreness. You're going to have soreness, whether you've had a vaginal delivery or a surgical yeah. delivery, but listening to, to that, if it's getting to the point of sharpness or where that soreness is more than just like, you know, a moment of it, that's your body saying it's time for you to slow down and take it easy. So yeah. listen, listen to your body as moms, as parents in general, that's so difficult to do because we're so focused on everyone else's needs. But mm -hmm. as we said before, put on your own oxygen mask first. Yeah. I think that's huge. Um, the other thing that's, you know, I, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, stay on top of your pain medication please pay attention to that. It's going to be so valuable for you. You won't need it forever, just, you know, a week or two. But if you can, if you can stay on top of it, then it's going to help your recovery in the long term for sure. Um, and then also another one that I don't hear a lot of recommendations for regularly yet, but seeing a pelvic floor therapist after you have had a cesarean. And that I think this applies to all kinds of cesareans, whether this was a planned cesarean and you didn't have any, um, you know, pushing or laboring or anything like that, or if you did go through a long labor and then you had to go to a cesarean. Um, and the reason for that is because when you've had a, a surgery like that, it is putting a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor. All of those organs have had to kind of shift. They were moved around physically by a surgeon. Um, there's a, there's so many different things that can be going on there. And then there's swelling in that area that can cause a lot of pressure um, down onto your pelvic floor, which can cause more issues later on. And they can also help with just the recovery period. They can help you learn how to do um, scar massage to make it so that your scar is going to be um, healthier and that you, you know, might be able to plan for a vaginal birth after cesarean later, um, or different things like that. That's, that's huge. And I don't think a lot of people know that pelvic floor therapists can help with that. Yeah. The VBAC part is so important. Sometimes we have people come to us and they're planning VBAC, but we weren't there for their first. And we wish that we could backdate the recommendation mm -hmm. of seeing a pelvic floor therapist before they got pregnant again, that would be mm -hmm. more ideal. Um, and it's not that you have to in order to have a VBAC. You can still have a VBAC, but we're increasing the likelihood of your chances because we're really helping work with all of those muscle groups. Again, like she said, helping mm -hmm. with the scar massage and all of that, that can be really, really beneficial in the long term. Super, super. Yeah, absolutely. So seeing a pelvic floor therapist, I think is super beneficial. Um, most insurances will cover it. And at least in Texas, you don't have to have a referral from your doctor to go see a pelvic floor therapist. So um, definitely reach out to professionals around you for referrals for pelvic floor therapy. Um, and then the last one that I have on here is to is to get walking, get up and, and get moving. This is, I think, where it differs a little bit from vaginal delivery. Vaginal delivery, we're like, okay, you need to sit down. I know you feel good, but you got to chill with a cesarean delivery. It's a little bit the opposite. You maybe don't feel as good. And a lot of times it's really just that you're nervous. Um, but getting up and moving when you can is really, really helpful. Just a few minutes a day where you 
you know, walk to the bathroom um, immediately after your surgery, after that six to 12 hour recovery time, getting up and doing just those little movements is going to help get your system moving. It'll get your, your bowels moving again, your intestines and everything. And then it's going to help with the blood flow and help with that recovery period. Um, we, we have seen it both ways. We have seen people who have cesareans and don't get out of bed for a month. And we have seen people who get out of bed as soon as they are physically able to. Um, we like kind of a middle ground of maybe not pushing yourself to the brink, but absolutely moving when you, you know, throughout the day when you can just, you know, a five minute walk a day can make a huge difference. And I think that might sound confusing to people where we're like, if you had a vaginal birth, we don't want you getting up and moving. But if you have a cesarean, we really do. It's not necessarily that there's a difference in your pelvic floor or the muscle, you know, or the organs or anything like that. Really, ideally, if you could sit around all day still with a cesarean, that would be great, except that we have those added benefits of the movement of getting your intestines and your bowels and all of those things moving again. Um, so it's the, the kind of the reward outweighs the risk for that little bit of movement. And it's more imperative when you've had that surgery. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I think that covers everything that we had on our list. But if any of you that are listening are thinking, hey, I wish they had talked about this or I want to know more about that, message us or comment or, you know, send, send us send us a, I don't know, owl or something. Let us know. We actually We'd reply. Love. Yeah. Carrier pigeon. I prefer carrier pigeon. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for listening and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you for joining us on Birth, baby. Thanks again to Longing for Orpheus for our music. You can look him up on Spotify. Remember to leave a review, share, and follow wherever you get your podcasts. See you next week.